What if I told you, yes, you can fall out of love? When two people fall in love and decide to marry, they seldom think about falling out of love. Yet, falling out of love does happen in marriage and a host of other circumstances in life. It happens during times of marital engagement. It happens with jobs and careers. It happens with cities and communities. Yes, falling out of love does happen. Bess Meyerson, the only Jewish Miss America, once said, To fall in love is awfully simple, but to fall out of love is simply awful. The worst reversal of love occurs when someone who once professed love for Jesus Christ abandons that love and no longer loves Jesus Christ as they once did. Falling out of love does happen. And we find recorded for us in Scripture an occasion when Jesus addressed this very issue, when followers of Christ fell out of love with him and his counsel to them. And we read that account for us in Revelation chapter 2. It's a letter written by Christ through the Apostle John to believers at the city of Ephesus. The city of Ephesus sat on the southwest corner of Asia, at that time, now Turkey. It was a prominent seaport in that day. It was second only to the city of Rome in importance in the whole Mediterranean area. It was a center for commerce, for shipping, for politics and religion. At one time, it was a hotbed for Christianity. Paul and his friends Priscilla and Aquila founded a body of Christ in the city of Ephesus. And Apollos even taught there. It was a prominent city in the realm of Christianity in the first century. And yet we read unmistakably today, Ephesus doesn't exist. It's abandoned, destroyed, overcome and conquered by the Gauls in the second century, never again to resume its once prominent stature either in the city either in the region of the Mediterranean or in comparison to Rome or in Christianity nobody lives there now it's kind of a swamp and barren land what happened what happened in Ephesus well Jesus describes for us his warning to them in the first century it's recorded for us in Revelation chapter 2 and we read Christ's letter as recorded there penned by the Apostle John, the church leader in that day, and all of the cities throughout southeast, southwest Asia, including the city of Ephesus. We read the warning from Christ through John to the believers at Ephesus in this fashion. We read in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, it says this, And to the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, and who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. What's he saying here? That's language that we don't typically use. He's talking about the occasion of his relationship to the church at Ephesus. And he describes himself as holding the stars in his right hand. Well, what were the stars? The stars were the church leaders. Describes them there as the angels. The leaders, the pastors, church leadership in the body of Christ in Ephesus. And then it says that he walks among the candlesticks. Well, what are the candlesticks? The candlesticks represented the individual bodies of Christ. The churches spread throughout southwest Asia. In particular, the church at Ephesus. And it speaks to us of Christ's revelation of himself. He says, I am the sovereign king. I hold the stars in my hand. I hold the pastors and leaders in my hand. And I walk among the churches. My presence is there. Not only am I sovereign, I'm omnipresent. Not only am I omnipresent, but we read right away in the beginning of verse number 2, it says, I know. Jesus wrote to them and said, I know what's going on there. I know you. So he has omniscience. 
He's a sovereign king. He is omnipresent. He fellowships with them. His presence is there. And he knows what's going on. He sees it. He knows. He understands. That's a picture of Christ. He revealed himself to these believers in Ephesus. And then he goes on to recognize their virtues. They had many favorable things about them that he could say. And he commented and remarked, and we would typically say when we read these commendations, wow, what a body, what a group of believers, outstanding, you would say. Well, let's read about some of these commendations that Christ gave to them. He says, I know your works, your labors. I know them. I see what you're doing. Hard work, sweating even, on my behalf and for my name. And I know you're patient, you're understanding, you wait. Not only that, but you can't bear them which are evil. You stand for truth and righteousness. You don't compromise with evil and with your culture about you. You stand for the truth. You, you reject that which is evil. And then it says, you tried those who said they are apostles and found them wanting. <laughs> those were false prophets in those days. They came saying and boasting that they were part of the apostles. Listen to me. Listen to what I have to say. And the believers at Ephesus tested them, questioned them, found them liars, and rejected them. Then we find also in verse number 3 of chapter 2, it says, You didn't faint. <laughs> you didn't quit. You kept at it. You were persistent. Then we read in verse number 6, Yet another thing for which he praised them. He says, I notice that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. So do I. <laughs> Who were the Nicolaitans? <laughs> they were a sex cult. They believed that only satisfaction in life occurred when you satisfied to its fullest with complete and full abandonment to sensuality and sexuality. And the believers at Ephesus rejected it. They hated those deeds. Had nothing to do with them. Quite a description, wouldn't you say? A very good church, we might conclude. Jesus gave them great praise, but then he went on to say in verse number three, he says, verse number four, nevertheless. <laughs> oh boy, here it comes. The other shoe. Nevertheless, I have something against you. And here's what I have against you. You don't love me like you did at the beginning. We read about that in Acts chapter 18 and 19, the foundation of this congregation, this assembly of believers in Ephesus. The great miraculous occurrences through Paul and through Priscilla and Aquila and the great preaching of, Aqu of Apollos in this congregation. So much so that a revival occurred and broke out and the people brought over 50,000 pieces of silver worth of pagan materials to be destroyed. How much was that value? Well, one piece of silver was the equivalent of one day's wage. In our day and age, that would be, you know, maybe somewhere around $80 a day. Times 50000 that's $4 million. They sacrificed, they destroyed it because it was contrary to their love for Christ. That's their passion that they had at the beginning. And Jesus said, you've left it. You abandoned it. You're not following it anymore. And on top of that, I'm not first. Your works are first. Good works. And they're good works. And he could point out to them very good things that they were doing. And he said, but that's, that's not as important as your love for me. <laughs> that must be first priority in your relationship with me. You've left it. You abandoned it. And he chastised them for their great sin. Then we read, not only did Christ reveal himself to them, not only did he recognize their virtues, but then he also rebuked them for their sin. They had left their first love, no longer a passion. Then we see that he gave them direction. 
and how they could reverse the trend, how they could experience revival amongst themselves and in their own individual lives. And we read his direction recorded for us in verse starting in verse number five. He says, Remember, <laughs> remember what it was like way back at the beginning when you first professed love for me and how I was first in your life? Remember that, because you have fallen from that. That is no longer a description of you and of your priorities in life. So I want you to remember that, first off. And then secondly, I want you to repent, because you have fallen from that. And what a great fall that was. You have fallen from it, and I want you to repent of that for which, from which you have fallen. And then I want you to repeat. I want you to do it again. <laughs> I want you to go back and make me first again. Love me with the passion that you had at the beginning and make it a priority in your life. Go back. Repeat. And then he gives these two strong words that we don't like to hear. Jesus said to them, Or else. Or else what? He said, or else I will remove your candlestick. Remember the candlestick represented the churches, the congregations? And he's warning them, if you don't go back, if you don't repent, if you don't remember, if you don't repeat and renew, I'll remove your congregation. It will exist no longer. We read presently that that occurred during the second century. The Gauls came in from the north and utterly destroyed the city of Ephesus. It has never again resumed its prominence nor its existence. It doesn't exist anymore. It's a swampland. Nothing there. A few pillars. A few relics of past days. Jesus fulfilled his promise and his warning to them. And it gives, gave to them a clear admonition as to why their church would fail because they emphasized good works instead of a passionate love for Christ. When we read that in the first part of chapter 2 of Revelation, why did Jesus send this to him? Why did Jesus Give this message to John for these believers in Ephesus. Well, he did so because he wanted to remind them of who he was. <laughs> Not just a person of history, but he was the sovereign authority and ruler. That he was the man in charge of all things. He wanted them to know his omnipresence. <laughs> he was there amongst them. And he was aware of what was going on. He was omniscient. All qualities of God describing Jesus. He knew what was going on. And he wanted them to renew that first love once again. He also wanted to warn them. Warn them what would happen if they failed to obey. He also wanted to give them courage and comfort, and a reminder of the future. Because he promised to them a reward. And we read that in the last verse, number 7, of this little passage of the letter to Ephesus. He says, If you obey, if you obey, this is what I will do. To him that overcometh I will give to eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. In Revelation chapter 21 and 22, the last two chapters of this outstanding book, we read about that paradise. We read about that new Jerusalem as described for us in Revelation 21. And then in verse chapter 22, we read that there is a throne where God sits. And out from under the throne comes a river that goes down the middle of the city. And on either side of the river, it's lined with trees. And what are those trees? <laughs> the tree of life. And Jesus promised them, if you overcome and you obey, you will join me in paradise and you will eat of that tree of life. The promise that God gave for his children, those who trusted and worshipped Christ. 
And Jesus wanted his believers, his followers, in Ephesus, in this congregation of believers, to know these truths and to be reminded of them, to be encouraged and comforted in the midst of their struggles. So you might ask the question then, well, what has that got to do with me? That was centuries ago. First century, my land. Years, thousands of years ago. What has that got to do with you and me? Well, it has everything to do with you and me, because what was true then is true now. Great similarities between our day and the day of Ephesus, as recorded here in Revelation chapter 2, exist in great extent. It can be described of us that we have left our first love as well. What kind of passionate love do we as professed followers of Christ have for him? All too often, for example, in our music, we sing songs of love and praise and affection for him and for he. Who's that? We don't even mention his name. We are so ashamed of him that we won't even mention his name in our music. How can that ever be described as worship? It isn't. Are we so ashamed of his name that we can't even mention it in our music? Or is it to the point where we are so far greater interested in the crossover benefit of our songs that will reap us more money if we don't mention the name of Jesus? And so we leave it out, and we just refer to it, refer to Christ as him or as he, hoping that people will see that it's Jesus. Why not mention his name? No, we avoid it, because we really don't love him. That's an example, because love is shown by our acts and by what we do. But what about our sacrifice? What about the centrality of Christ in our worship? What about the centrality of Christ in the practice of our fellowship together as believers. Have we, like these in Ephesus, come to emphasize good works greater than our passion and love for Christ? I fear that we have, to a great extent. So things that Jesus covered in this message to the believers at Ephesus correlate to our day as well. In our day, we can learn the lesson that Jesus taught to the believers at Ephesus. Yes, we can fall out of love. And when we do, and when we emphasize works instead of love for Christ, churches fail. And churches fail today for the same reason. Well, therefore, what implications does this have upon you and me for our lives today, for the congregations which we attend? Well, it has significant implications. First of all, for believers. For example, you may claim that you are a follower of Christ. You would profess that you are a Christian, that you obey and follow Christ. What about your love for him? Is he first? Is he your first love? Is he your first affection? Is his glory and honor the first thing of importance in your life? Or is it something else? Anything else? Anything that might even be good? No value. No value. The only thing of value is love for Christ. And we prove and show our love for Christ by our obedience by seeking after him, desiring after him above all things, sacrificing, as the parables teach us, even pearls of great price to love him, to serve him, to obey him. Well, what about the occasional one who might be watching who would be called an unbeliever, one who all your life you have rejected God, you have no interest in following him, you have no interest in Jesus Christ, maybe not even as a historical figure. You have no interest at all, never have, don't want it, up until this point in your life. Well, I want you to hear the word of the Lord to you today. 
because you are here watching this at the appointment of God, and he wants to speak to you. And here's what he would remind you and tell you. He would remind you that, first of all, you are born in sin. All of us are. Every human ever born, other than Adam and Eve, they were not born in sin. They were born perfect, created perfect by God himself. Everyone after that was born in sin because of their sin of disobedience as displayed in the Garden in Eden. You have a sinful nature. Your sinful nature dominates you, prevents you, and keeps you from ever pursuing after God. You have no interest. You're not able to. You don't want to. You need divine intervention in your life to come to know God as he has revealed himself in creation, in his word, and in his son, Jesus Christ. He has made provision for people like you and me. The provision of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus came to bridge the gap, to bridge the valley, if you will, the chasm in between you and God that exists because of your sinful nature. Jesus bridged that gap for people like you and like me. God gave him, he became incarnate in human flesh, set aside his form with God and took the form of a servant, came and lived a sinless, holy, righteous, obedient life. The life that he lived qualified him for the death that he died. And the death that he died was an offering unto God on behalf of sinners like you and me, paying our penalty, paying the penalty that people like you and I deserve to pay. He paid it to God, and God accepted that offering. He accepted it on behalf of people like you and me. And God said, for everyone who believes upon Jesus and his sacrificial offering on their behalf, I will accept I will reconcile back to myself. I will bridge that gap through Christ. I will make them furthermore children of God. And I will give to them, implant in them a new life, a new power, my presence, my life living within them, giving them the faith to believe in Christ, giving them the faith to obey and to follow me and to experience transformation in life. I pray for both of you this morning, today, those of you who are believers who need to remember and repent and repeat a first love for Jesus Christ, confessing and repenting and turning from your abandonment of your love for Christ and renew that love once again, making it a priority in your life. And then for you who might not to this point have ever trusted in Christ. I pray that the Spirit of God will come to you today and regenerate you, give you new life, give you new life within you that enables you to believe and trust upon the provision of God in Christ on your behalf, trusting Christ and his sacrifice as for you, and experience God's reconciling you back to himself giving to you new life. Well, I pray that today the Spirit of God will bring about these transformations in your life as a believer and in your life as an unbeliever, that you might, from this day forward, walk in newness of life. May God come and bring these blessings into your lives today is my prayer.